Welcome to Stumbling Toward Genius. I'm your host, writing and creativity coach, Cynthia Morris. In this episode, you'll hear about a big moment in my creative career and how it challenged me to my limits. You'll see how I abandoned myself for the sake of others. We're living in a world with others, and there are structures and systems that we have to inhabit, right? But there are times when the structures stifle not only our creativity, but our very essence. I've been a speaker for a long time, but it's rare that I put together a slide deck. When I say rare, I mean like four decks total. Partly because putting together a slide deck isn't in my genius zone. Partly because I'm afraid the system will fail and will waste everyone's time dicking around with the equipment. Because this happens all the time. On the other hand, I like a challenge. I've been a fan of the Pachacacha style talk. This is where the speaker has five minutes and 20 slides. The slides move automatically, so the talk has to be timed and practiced. This always sounded fun, but practicing? Also not in my genius zone. I resist it hard. Sometimes the things we cling to as, this is just who I am, really work against us. And sometimes our stubborn commitment to our way serves us. I'm so much more of an improv performer than a memorized speaker, but I still thought it would be a fun challenge to do a talk like this, even though I'm a deck dork with meager slide-making skills. Back in 2016, I was already signed up for Icon 9, the biannual conference for illustrators, when I saw a call for proposals on Twitter. This conference hosts a participant round where six participants do a pacha kacha style talk with slides for five minutes. This was my chance to do this kind of talk, so I pitched one called How I Ditched Practical Advice and Started an Unlikely Career as an Illustrator. I sent my proposal off and then moved on with life, which meant, at that time, going to Paris. I was with my friend Carl for two months in Paris. We had spent about a year designing our own artist residency. This was our chance to live the dream, an artist in Paris. We took over an apartment in the 11th arrondissement and made art, pastries, and had lots of laughs. Yes, Carl made pastries, the most delicious fruit tarts with flaky crust. We'd rented the apartment of a pizza aficionado, and it was supplied with all the pastry-making tools you could want. So, when in Paris... I was having fun. I'd finally set things up so that my artist had the bulk of my days. I was immersed in making watercolor paintings based on the things that inspired me. I had pre-sold a series of paintings and loved this time to be immersed in color and shape and, yep, pastries. Fun, challenging, and a dream come true. Until, one day, an email arrived. This is the kind of email you want and crave. The approval. The yes. I had been chosen to be one of the six Icon 9 participants to take the stage and deliver a Pacha Kacha style talk. Perhaps you can imagine my reaction to this email. I had Carl take a picture when I got the news. My face shows a blend of joy, incredulity, and oh, frickedness! You know how when you get the thing you want, the thing that's a stretch, it's, it's a real challenge. It's the thing you thought you wanted until you get it and then you poop your pants. That's pretty much what this was like, but don't worry, there was no actual poop. I had six weeks to pull together a talk with images. There I was in Paris in my own la-la land, making paintings and having coffee dates with friends. Pulling my act together to make a presentation was not on my to-do list. But this was my chance. My chance to rise above my fears. My chance to publicly own that I am an artist. To do something I'd always wanted to do. I started to get a little bit excited. I could choose artwork to illustrate my talk. I could put my best artwork before hundreds of visual professionals. No pressure. No, none at all. As I said, I've been giving talks for years, so I set about writing a short speech that would sum up my journey as an artist, peppered by the bad advice that I got. 
Starting with the F I got in high school art, the clear signal to abandon any idea of being an artist. I mapped out my points, and then I began to gather images of my art. I had brought my external hard drive with me to Paris. I scrolled through the images. As I worked, I noticed I was accompanied by a deep, primal, daily fear. You, you've heard of the inner critic. You perhaps have heard your own inner critic whispering its bad advice in your ear. This was like that, but worse. It was like the inner critic had a death grip on my guts and was squeezing, squeezing, squeezing every day. It told me I didn't have anything to say, that telling my own stories would induce a group yawn and that I never, ever should have raised my hand to apply for this. It sucked. It was all kinds of suck. It sucked all the joy out of the process of making my presentation. The truth is, I'm just not really comfortable telling my own stories. I'd much rather float above my vulnerability in a conceptual cloud of ideas. This podcast itself has been a real challenge to share the stories that I've experienced and to believe that they will be useful and inspiring. But my God, this fearful attitude had to stop. I'm a coach, after all. I know how to deal with this kind of thing. Come on. Of course, it's easier when it's someone else's inner critic. But one day, I had a talk with myself. Listen, self, I said. You can either live immersed in daily fear, or you can get a freaking handle on this. Make the choice you already made when you pitched your idea. Come on, you have what it takes to get up there and deliver something interesting. Own it, damn it. This is a moment of change for you. So I listened and I owned it. I dove in daily and I swam hard past those fears. It was all starting to come together. But one day, my external hard drive started making glug, 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 glug noises. And then it was like, I'm out. <laughs> the hard drive refused to connect with the computer. I replugged, plugged it in, rebooted, tried to revive it. But no. It was really done. I did what any good American would do. I got on the phone with Apple support. Apple support in France, in French. After many hours and troubleshooting hoops and learning all kinds of new vocabulary that I had never had before, we determined that the hard drive was not going to come back to life. Of course, I did what anyone would do. I panicked. I had to pull out a new mantra. Ne panique pas. So the days trickled by, my deadline looming closer and larger. I coped the way I do when I get under pressure. Lots of pastries. I'm kind of kidding. But the way I really deal with creative stress is to make some space for myself. To let myself savor the things that I enjoy. Carl and I made art during the day and biked around Paris at night. We went to a Radiohead concert that was fantastic and I danced my ass off. We shopped at the outdoor market and made fabulous fresh meals. Giving myself these pleasures made it easier to work on the presentation. I'm grateful that I was in Paris during this time. Being there made it easier to absorb the joy of life alongside the work of making this presentation. At home, it's all too easy to get sucked into the grind and to not take breaks for inspiration and replenishment. I limped along with the images I had on Dropbox. I finally somehow pulled it together. I practiced as much as I could, biking my way through Paris, reading my lines aloud. I'm just so terrible at practicing my talks. I know it's important, but I just, I just resist it. But with 20 slides in five minutes, you have to have your act together. There's no room to wander off on a tangent. I flew home from Paris with a suitcase packed with art and treasures that I like to buy there. Mustard and fancy French salt, if you must know. There was a quick trip to Portland, then down to Austin for the conference. I had bought a new dress and I was ready to go. I had psyched myself up for this and I was ready. But when I got to Austin, I received an email from the organizers asking where my slides were. I I had sent them weeks ago. But alas, one erroneous letter in the email address sent the slide deck into the cyber dump. Oh my God, this is not how I operate. I am not a slide into home plate at the last minute kind of gal. 
I am a get it done weeks in advance kind of person. Don't don't get me wrong. This isn't some goody two shoes approach to productivity. Honestly, I just can't stand the tension of waiting until the last minute. It's easier for me to do things early so I can rest in perhaps a false sense of security that all is well. The tech guy was calmer than I was. He was a freaking Zen master. He gently suggested that I resend the deck. I did, but it still didn't arrive until the last minute, like the minute before all six of us filed on stage. At moments like this, I sometimes channel my clients. I know they are hiring me to help do the scary things, but I don't see them as one down or me as better or more advanced than them. I see them as brave souls showing up to do the work of creating. So in that moment, before going on stage, I called to mind Kathy. She's a talented singer and performer who has been working to bring more of herself into her work. She does house concerts and performs at senior centers. They just love her and her style. One time, Kathy was performing at a friend's wedding. She was so excited about the opportunity to bring her gifts to her friend's special day. And she was scared poopless. Lots of factors, a new sound system, accompanying herself, being in a new venue, were really putting her out of her comfort zone. But together we worked our way toward performance day and she managed to calm her nerves. She sent a text voice message to me afterward. The joy, the relief, and the undeniable power in her voice made me smile. Remember this moment, I said. This is the joy on the other side of daring. You have earned it. Savor it and do something special for yourself. As I climbed the stage, I borrowed some of the feeling Kathy shared with me that day. That on the other side of fear is a power only we can give ourselves. We, me and my fellow speakers, were on stage sitting on stools during the whole presentation. So while the other presenters went ahead of me, I had to send my resting bitch face off stage. I had to adopt the expression that says, I'm listening to your talk. I'm entranced by your message. I'm not freaking out and rehearsing my own presentation. I had to pretend I wasn't freaked out that there was not one giant screen for the speaker's images, but two. My art would be projected on two giant screens to over 600 visual professionals. 600 discerning visual professionals. When it came my time to speak, I stepped up to the mic, hoping that my quaking was not visible to the audience. Once the first few seconds passed, I got into the groove. I told the story of my high school F the advice to specialize, and all the other advice that steered me into a pen and not into the wild, open field of my own genius. I made it through the five minutes, and people clapped, and I survived. But I learned something important. Later, watching the other speakers, I noticed something about them. Most of the presenters were illustration rock stars, And most of them got on stage and said something about how they're not great public speakers. But despite their disclaimers, they all crushed their talks. They disarmed the audience with their honesty and vulnerability. They were real. It was like they had their talks planned, but it never seemed canned. My own talk, following the given structure, felt canned to me. It felt like the juice and zest of my personality had gotten squozen out. I had left myself behind to fit into the format. I didn't feel the connection with the audience that I usually thrive on. It's ironic that my talk about ditching bad advice felt flat because I was following advice or a formula. The main point I made in my talk was that the biggest risk we take is following our own hearts and trusting our own instincts for our creative projects. How do we fit into the formula and break the rules? It's something I stumble on every day. This made me aware that even though sometimes we have to follow the rules, we can never, ever leave our authenticity behind. We all have to trust ourselves, to stay true to ourselves. Even as we work with others, we cannot stifle our voice, diminish our humor, or leave our essence behind. We can inhabit the can, but not be molded by the can. Here's what I don't want to tell you. This conference was really tough. 
I had thought that those illustrators were my people. But just because we shared similar tools, moleskin notebooks and super fast pens, doesn't mean we're kin. I struggled through the conference without a buddy and without connections. Honestly, I'm not as gregarious as I would like to think I am. I tried to connect with people, and I hoped that my talk would help us connect better. And it did, a little. But I confess that I was glad when it was finally over and I could go home where Steve was waiting with love and acceptance. I recently met someone who completely inspires me to be fully myself 100%. At the World Domination Summit, I saw Tanya Katan speak. She was hilarious, touching, and so smart. Her story and the way she told it filled me with incredible permission. I sat there in the dark audience and I just wanted to bawl. I didn't know what I was feeling, but it was strong. Afterward, flooded with emotion, I ran out to the lobby and bought her book. I stood in line to get a photo with her and to gush about how great she was. I was a new fangirl and I didn't care how silly I looked in my enthusiasm. Tanya's book, Creative Trespassing, is a wonderful guide to how to embrace our kooky creative selves in any environment. Not just to do it and to hope that we're tolerated, but because our creative kooky selves are vital to the world and are needed. We're wired to stay safe, and that often means looking good and playing by the rules. But I'm going to take up Tanya's invitation to be a creative trespasser. The people I admire most are wholly themselves, despite what others may think of them. They're usually spicy and strong and flavorful in their delivery. And we need all the flavors. We need you to bring your unique genius flavor to life. We don't want our creativity stifled by notions of how we should do things. And sometimes a little structure is a good thing because it's all too easy to get distracted and lose our way. Again and again, the need I hear most from people and the need that goes unfulfilled is the need to connect with like-minded creatives. That's why I developed the Original Impulse Atelier. This program is for creatives of all types. In our atelier, we've had bloggers, artists, novelists, authors, and performers. Everyone has loved the variety and has learned from the different perspectives that each member brings. And you know what? It's a safe space to create and grow and try things out. We don't have to worry about looking good while we're experimenting and growing and making. What a relief. The best thing about the Original Impulse Atelier is that we have a simple structure to help you stay on track. But within that structure, you're free to work in your own way. You set your milestones, goals, and deadlines. And then we hold you accountable to it. The atelier begins in January and seats are filling fast. I carefully curate our members and limit enrollment so we can have the best creative year ever. Go to OriginalImpulse.com to see if the Original Impulse is the place for you and your creative genius. Today's creative competency is staying true to yourself, even within a structure. We all have to play our roles in society, at work, in our home lives, in our creative communities. But that doesn't mean we have to leave ourselves behind to do it. Don't leave yourself behind to fit into the formula. Seek to be who you are, wherever you are. I believe it's the parts we often leave behind that make up our inimitable genius. Our authentic expression is at stake. What parts of you do you leave behind when trying to fit in? Perhaps it's your humor or irreverence, or maybe your honesty. Take a look at the cost of leaving parts of yourself out. What goes missing? What's lost when you leave parts of yourself behind? Make a new commitment to bring all the parts of you to the project that will truly contribute its genius to the world. What will help you bring all of you to the work? Frankly, friends, we don't need more stuff that fits a safe and tidy mold. We need your bold and messy genius. So bring it. Bring it all. Bring the parts of you that you even think are the weird bits. Because those, my friend, are most likely the essence of your genius. Head over to OriginalImpulse.com slash podcast to download this week's assignment. 
email me or leave a comment with insights you glean or actions you take as a result of the assignment. You'll find my contact info at originalimpulse.com. Thank you for listening to Stumbling Toward Genius. I hope this episode has helped you find your way towards your own genius and that you bravely take on your own creative projects, no matter how much you stumble or how scary it is. Until next time, creative genius, have fun. Coucou, it's Xavier. I'm back. I, I wanted to tell you something and don't tell Cynthia that I'm here. I wanted to let you know something about this story that she did not tell you. I was there in France with her when this happened and I saw her. She was so stressed out. It was just awful. She was really like not even eating the pastries like she said. She was like a droopy dog, just all worried about... What were people going to think of her? Was she going to be good enough? Et cetera, et cetera. But then when I told her, listen, what are you doing here in Paris? What are you doing? You are here to enjoy. And whether you are working on this project and doing this uh, slide, picture cha thing, it doesn't matter. You must enjoy it. Otherwise, why do it? Just stop. Just stop and go home and just give up. Don't do it. If it's going to cause so much pain, mon dieu. And we finally, after having a long walk along the Canal Saint-Martin, we had uh, an insight. She saw that she could do it and she could just drop the idea of having to be so good or look good or, oh, mon Dieu, what was it going to look like? So we had a little ceremony. We threw the fear into the canal. We just tossed it in. We let it go. And the joy that she had after she did that, we had a good laugh. We just had more walking and talking and... Okay, we went and we had a little drink at the cafe aussi, but uh, it was so different. And then after that, I saw her the following week and she was so much happier and just really enjoying it and really letting the project uh, take her over. So, And the other thing I want to tell you is it wasn't so bad. Her, her, her uh, what you call her speech, her talk, her, her performance, whatever, it was uh, not bad at all. And... We have this thing where we are so painfully critical of our own work and it's just, it's a sort of meanness. It's a little cruel, I think. So that's all, that's all I wanted to tell you to just really give yourself the chance to drop the dread and drop the pain and the fear. It is really not helping at all and let yourself enjoy the whole thing even if it's scary and you, you're going to do fine. You're going to be fine with it. And Okay, that's it. I got to go. That's it. Au revoir. <laughs>